Good morning. For those that I haven't met before, welcome. I'm Bill Rosehart. I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the Schulich School of Engineering. And I'm very pleased that you've been able to join us today for our final Schulich Connects of our academic year, Perspectives on Engineering Leadership, and I'm sure the discussion will be really great. This event is proudly sponsored by TD Insurance. The University of Calgary is located in the heart of southern Alberta, and we both acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Sasika, the Pakani, and the Kainai First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chinakee, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Moving to our formal program, engineering leadership continues to evolve and I think has grown better to serve our communities. But it's never been more important to have engineering leaders and engineering voices around the table to come up with innovative solutions to the challenges and many opportunities facing our community and globally. So our discussion today will focus on the ever dynamic need of engineering leaders in the ever changing profession. So some log logistics before I pass it on to our speakers. Uh, for our guests, hold your questions and our moderator will call on you to uh, have an opportunity to ask those questions. You'll see we have two mics here, and although I know most of you will be really good at projecting your voice, I still ask that you come up to the mic so that we can ensure everybody can hear your questions. I'd now like to take a moment to introduce to you our moderator, Dr. Lale Bechat, who is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Software Engineering here at the Schulich School of Engineering. Dr. Bechat is also the INSERC, which is our federal funding agency. Uh, she's the INSERC Chair for Women in Science and Engineering for the Prairies region. She has acted as an academic advisor for Google's Technical Development Guide and was a member of Google's Council on Computer Science Education. Dr. Bechat has received numerous awards and is passionate about increasing the status of women in STEM-related fields. She's currently running a change leadership program, Wise Planet, with the mission to build a just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive society. So I'll now pass things off to Lale, who will introduce us to today's guest. Uh, thank you so much, Bill, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this Schulich Connect session, which is one of my favorites in the series. Uh, I'm a professor in electrical and software engineering. Uh, my main research is on building computers. What I do is I make sure your computers run as fast as possible, or your phones run as fast as possible with as little energy as possible. So that's basically my job, but also I have developed this leadership program for uh, making the next generation of leaders in engineering and science, teaching them how to uh, think systemically as engineers do, and uh, design for disruptive technologies that are coming our way. Um, I would now like to introduce our guest speaker for today, and it's my honor and a pleasure to welcome Judy Fairburn. She's a co-CEO and fund managing partner of The 51, a financial feminist platform and venture fund. Judy served on the Global Advisory Council for Emerald Technology Ventures and was board director of Sustainable Development Technology Canada. She was also the first female board chair of Alberta Innovates for health, agriculture, clean energy, and digital. Judy co-founded a clean tech digital venture called uh, Evoc Innovations. She is a fellow of the Canadian Academy, Academy of Engineering and the recipient of 2020 Calgary Influential Women in Business Lifetime Achievement Award. Welcome, Judy. Thank you. So what are you going to grill me on? 
<laughs> so to get the panel warmed up, uh, to get the audience warmed up, I would like to start with some questions <laughs> first. So would you please uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your path to leadership? Um, it's a real honor to be here this morning, probably a little earlier than I used to like to start engineering classes here. Um, I'm, a, I'm a grad, 1985, it's a while ago, from, from uh, University of Calgary and chemical engineer, um, and that was my first career, and it was really foundational, and um, I highlight a little bit of that uh, this morning. Um, in my bio, I also would love to just highlight how honored I was to, to uh, be awarded the Schulich um, Alumni Leadership Excellence Award. That meant a lot. We, we did that through COVID, and uh, now I kind of feel like this is our opportunity <laughs> to, to, to build from that, so thanks so much. Um, so I want to just talk about, uh, I find stories really help to uh, bring leadership lessons. I love reading biographies. And uh, my, my career to this point um, is really been three acts. Three, and I think we are chatting um, about uh, the impact of uh, different things on our lives and we're talking about lunchbox theater and, and the like. So three acts. The first career was really as, a, as an engineer. That was my first 15 years. And uh, coming out of here, um, I actually jumped into oil sounds. And because and, uh, it was new, complex, frankly, away from Calgary. I grew up in Calgary and wanted to get a little bit further. I know it wasn't that far. Um, and I can't say that I loved climbing high in the sky equipment. Back then, we had to do a lot of things manually and uh, checking pressure, pressure gauges at the top of distillation columns and stuff like that. I think they just did that to test new engineers. But um, I had a lot of engineering field and business roles um, in energy and gas, was early in carbon capture and storage and, and refining. And I think what I found that I tended to, to lean towards roles where you could shape your path versus follow that this is the way you're supposed to do it. And uh, that's been a leadership theme throughout my career. Um, and uh, in the late 1990s, I had the chance to partner with, and this is also a theme, with. Uh, folks from a different industry, mining actually, when I was with Shell, and uh, we developed uh, an oil sands GHG reduction technology, uh, paraffinic froth treatment that's now widely used in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of barrels, and it was one of the leading um, reasons for GHG intensity come down in oil sands. But what I, what I learned through that role was, and we were able to do it in seven years to commercial, which was great. Um, the power of working together with others that are different background than yourself, but also how technical people seem to struggle to really influence management. And I'm sure a lot in the room here that can resonate with you. So that, that, that uh, had me say, okay, let's go learn a little bit more, and I went and did an MBA. And um, I chose intentionally a novel format there of a university in, this, in, in Eastern Canada that was about, I, I realize now, one third in, uh, one third in person, two thirds virtual. Actually loved the format, and um, and was because it allowed one to be amongst people that were different from myself, different parts of Canada, different backgrounds, and again that theme of learning from people and being curious about folks in different parts of the country, um, different realms, and, um, and and how you can learn through that, and what what that enables, how that enables you to be innovative was really key. Um, and it was a change catalyst. And if I can go just a bit longer on stories, would that be okay? Um, and and um, I jumped from that point to, to join Pan Canadian and do venture stuff. And many years later, um, had a once in a lifetime opportunity to move to Ottawa. Um, and so, what I'm going to highlight here is the value of once in a lifetime opportunities and grabbing them. We were in a situation where um, Prime Minister Cretchen at the time had implemented Kyoto. Calgary industry was saying, what are we going to do? Like, how are we actually going to execute on those commitments? And I think that is an important theme many of us worry about as engineers. And so uh, had the chance to go work in the center of the federal government and um, focus a lot on in innovation, trade, immigration policy. Again, the importance of all of us from many different backgrounds in, in driving Canada forward. And, and I noted that many, many of the most successful entrepreneurs weren't born in Canada because of that drive to even to, to manage to come to this country and then to do new things and a lot of respect there. Um, and and, and you, you can see here that innovation is really at, at the core of, of what, I, what I be. And when I went back to, to industry from there in Canada, I um, was thrilled to be at Weyburn and, and leading that CCS operation and then 
we split to Synovus and uh, took on early in the industry as head of sustainability, then business innovation, chief digital officer, and many other functions, um, and then Albert Innovate. So, and, and I think I will talk a little bit more about all the learnings from that, but, but I think what I've learned is that I love co-founding new ventures and, and the power of when you are, you find someone, it's never usually planned. Um, that cares about what you care about and has a very different background than you and just what's possible to create. So that's really, you know, when I was so involved in just seeing the future of Alberta as the chair of Alberta Innovates and propelled me to my third career to take the entrepreneurial path and uh, to co-found the 51 mentor founders through Creative Destruction Lab and all that we do at the 51 and we'll get into that a bit later but hopefully there's a few th stories through that and themes that, that sort of sit with you in terms of shaping your path versus following and really appreciating and being curious, learning from people from different worlds and how, how that creates opportunity and the ability to innovate and drive change. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so as a leader, um, we want, uh, you want to have like Alberta and Canada become the global leaders in innovation and technology. Uh, what can you tell us why bringing in more di diversity and inclusivity can make us more innovative? So I think building from a little bit of the stories that I did at the beginning here, I, the, there's a couple threads that are super important to me and, and, and you keep coming back to it. And I'm very passionate about Calgary, what we drive from here. Canada, you know, innovation, unlocking, you know, the potential women and others that are underestimated. And, you know, I, I think it's so critical that we, I think we're in Canada, and I've been on fe various federal panels and on economic strategy and in Alberta and the like, uh, we are a nation that I think is pretty strong on technology and science uh, in terms of can punch above its weight. We see Canada as a leader, early leader in artificial intelligence. You know, and many in this room would know, you know, three of the most uh, significant leaders um, in artificial intelligence came from, from the, the research realm in, in Canada. And, and I think it's really, really critical then to recognize, I'm going to take diversity and inclusivity in a different direction here for a moment, that you, to, to be able to take your best ideas and actually drive into business success takes some different skills. And uh, I think in Canada, we... Uh, really also need to embrace what it takes to actually scale up um, good ideas and innovations. The role of, and I've learned a lot about this through my partners in the 51, the role of marketing and how important it is. Um, and, you know, I think, Bill, even in our little chat earlier, um, you can have the best plans um, and the like. But you have to figure out what's going to actually resonate and um, simplify wh what you're going to do to, to really build the momentum of, of people. And so I come back to the value of, of diverse perspectives um, to, to drive there. If I go a little probably more in your question, I know I diverted, <laughs> of, of what it's going to take, you know, why bringing in more diversity and inclusion makes a difference. Um, I, I, a thread that hopefully is already coming through in, in the remarks is that I found that collaboration with those different than yourself, um, whether that's age, um, backgrounds in terms of careers, where you've got cultures that you've grown up with in the world, gender, um, and more. Um, when, you, when you come together, um, there's just a magic spark. And I've seen that in many of my, the favorite things I've been involved in. And to, uh, the frame that I like to say is that collaboration makes change possible versus seemingly impossible if you strive alone. And uh, so again, uh, I'm a strong believer that diverse experiences in one's career and your networks um, that really unlock learning and innovation. Yeah, thank you. And so in Canada and uh, in Alberta, we have been very innovative and that probably also comes from that diversity that you came, you talked about and also of the fact that uh, we are including many people from diverse backgrounds here. But then how do we go from that innovation that we are building to uh, business? So I, I must say, in this third act of mine, um, you know, I've got to had many different portfolios as a senior executive. Um, boy, have I learned a lot in the last five years. And um, being involved with Creative Destruction Lab and, and mentoring founders there that have got a great, usually science, um, tech-based uh, idea, 
what it actually takes to turn it into a business. And I think we often underestimate how hard a job that is. And the, I, I go, the, the word, even the word innovation, I think, is used by many almost. It sort of slips off your tongue. But, but it's, it's a very involved um, accomplishment to actually innovate. And, and I like the OEC definition that essentially comes from the frame of really it's, it's implementing to drive value from technology, business models, et cetera, that, that, uh, that does things differently. And it's that implementing to drive value that I would suggest is what's really critical here. It's not just the invention. And you know, drawing from the different experiences and working with a lot of founders, um, you know, right now we have 30 in our portfolio, We've probably met with, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. You learn a lot. It's like mini MBA in every, every founder that you work with and invest in. Um, and what I really have recognized, and I think as engineers, we're really good at many, many things. Um, and I think also we often bridge to the financial world pretty well too. The, the financial and commercial acumen is absolutely critical. To be able, and then I mentioned already marketing, so understanding how to have your great idea appeal to others, especially customers and coming from their frame. Those are really, really critical skills. And then, you know, scaling up, especially in the world of engineering, where, you know, it, it, software engineering in digital probably is a little bit easier, but when you're dealing with anything that's hard tech, whether, you know, electrical, chemical, civil, um, bio, um, um, there's a lot of things that can derail you on your path in terms of scaling up, not just the, you know, bringing it from an early stage in a lab up to field implementation, but, but regulatory and, and, um, and customers and when will they actually commit? You know, you think they're interested, but it could be years in terms of you're mismatched between what you think they're ready and you really got to clarify expectations and when capital or, or signing on the dotted line for those contracts will actually come. And, and so I, I'd say from that, the importance of surrounding yourself as innovators with those that have these different backgrounds because it's a challenging path. I think we have over glamorized, if you don't mind my candor, um, the role of an entrepreneur in, in society. It is and I know this from co-founding and co-running 51, it is a very challenging path. So you need to surround yourselves with those different new, and again, that drives to the importance of, of diversity of experiences and, and, and being coachable yourself. That was a bit meaty, sorry. <laughs> no, no, not at all. But one of the things I really love about your work is you're a doer. So you see the problem and then you find best ways to solve it. And that's sort of reflected in the uh, co-founding the 51. Uh, now, according to the 51 website, 30% <laughs> uh, of Alberta's tech startup are founded or co-founded by women, which is great. Uh, we want to make it to the 51% of them, but uh, <laughs> we are on our way. Uh, but on the other hand, only 2% of them receive venture capital funding. Uh, or two percent of the startups uh, by women uh, start, receive that funding worldwide. Can you tell us what is 51 and your role in it, and how you would like it to impact the future, both in terms of innovation and business and overall society? Um, love to, and it was neat walking around the room before this to know how many of you have heard of the 51. Um, we got started in 2019. Can we have a show of hands? <laughs> That'd many? be interesting. How many have? And it's okay if it's only a few. Okay, there's a few. That's good. Oh, 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 pretty good. It's awesome. So, um, and um, so, what does the 51 stand for? And I'll tell you what it is. First of all, as a business, and 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 more in community, uh, women is 51 percent of the population, and that's an international statistic. And uh, what myself and the, a couple of uh, tech entrepreneurs who I met. Um, through you know, just being introduced, and that's often how these things come together, uh, being out there in the network. And uh, we could just see that, and they were living through their lived experience and how hard it was as very smart, driven, um, they're, these, these women, they just make so much happen. And this is Alice uh, Reimer, who's been a real driver in Creative Destruction Lab, 
and um, a founder herself, um, and, uh, and Shelly Kuypers, who was very involved in the early days of Solium, you know, one of the, the big success stories from, from Calgary. And uh, they said how hard it was to raise financing as, as a woman entrepreneur. And that was really their motivation. My motivation was just being so involved in sustainability um, in the early days and many other aspects of innovation in Alberta and just seeing, and, and, and no disrespect to the guys in the room, it takes all of us, but, but how many of the women that I knew were actually the leading catalysts for change. And so what would be possible if we harnessed that together? And that was really the, the start of the 51. We pulled uh, 75 people, women, together um, in, in one of our houses. And then they said, yeah, let's go do this. And they were our early investors. And uh, you know what it is, is uh, we've come together now as a community globally online, over 20,000, uh, over 200 investors, three investment funds um, invested in over 30 founders. Um, and, uh, and, and, along, and along with areas that we invest in, in health, in uh, sustainable energy, our recent announced food and agricultural technology fund led by a woman that was one of our early investors and, and drank the Kool-Aid and has come along big time, Alison Sundstrom. Um, and uh, we have really driven it from there and it's been a flywheel of change by bringing together the, and it's really interesting when you bring together individuals that are driven by a sense of joint purpose, joint purpose, how much change you can drive. And, and, and I think, you know, you get, you get the investors that want to drive change, you get the founders that are motivated, and we work with, with women and diverse founders. And we work with those that are aspiring. So those in the room that say, oh, that's not me yet, um, and we work with a lot of younger women in particular, we've partnered with the House Gaines School of Business on an educational program to teach the basics, because a lot of times it's just, it's just lingo. People are smart. You just, it's, sometimes you think, oh, I don't get that. I, don't, I shouldn't be at the table in terms of the lingo investing. Um, so that, that's a bit about what it's, what it's about. And I think that there's a key aspect of what also drives us that I'm happy for you to dive into. Yeah, uh, so um, one of the things that I learned from the 51 was that uh, there's an impending belt shift to, uh, to, to women. That's, uh, why, what is it and why is it critical for women? So one of, uh, we've done a lot of work on, on looking at statistics out there. Data matters, forecasts matter. And one of the things that blew us away was that many of the financial firms in Canada are forecasting by the end of the decade that women will be uh, responsible for two-thirds of the private wealth. And that's through demographics, the careers that are being chosen, things of that nature, and absolutely blew us away. And when you, when, you, when you look at it from that perspective, it becomes actually an economic imperative to make sure that all of us are, are comfortable enough in the financial realm to make good decisions for ourselves. And so that prompted, that's um, been a driver of the 51, but it's also been a driver of setting up our not-for-profit movement 51 that, that, that works on the education and community building in this regard, like through the House Game program and others. Uh, and it, you know, it's, that's where this term, and, and I initially riled at, at the term feminism, and, but, but when I look at things from their, from their basic definition, to, you know, to me, financial feminism, actually, it's an econ economic imperative to be equal and to consider yourself equal on all matters financial. It's a mindset. And that's what we really tried to drive by. And then the power of when you do that and we unlock the potential of all of us, what that does to drive our economy. And, and, and I think coming out of Calgary, some would think, hmm, really? This is happening in Calgary? Actually, this, Calgary and Alberta this is the perfect place for this to happen. And we get that question across Canada. We are national. Um, and our investors and founders are across the country, uh, including financial institutions and foundations and individuals. Because if you think of it, Famous Five started here. There's a lot of, pi we have a pioneering spirit in this province that just says, hey, there's a problem, let's just get after it and do it. And that's really our mindset. Yeah. And uh, going to this mindset, a lot of the time this pioneering or can-do attitude of Calgary means that we need to get out of our comfort zone. Do you agree? Um, yeah, ab absolutely. And I'd say a lot of that is, is comfort zone to me, 
and it builds from the earlier points, is moving from beyond the usual gang you hang out with. Because innovation comes from, like what I just loved, is most of the favorite things I've been able to be part of, I wouldn't have predicted that they would happen. But they happen because you get into a room, you're introduced to someone who might care about something you care about. Before you know it, you might be building something together. So getting out of your comfort zone is the secret to innovation in my mind. Uh, um, on the other hand, I want to sort of have a little bit of a um, discussion about this, is that as we challenge the culture and people asking people to get out of their comfort zone, Sometimes there's also people don't feel safe or brave enough to be, or included enough to be able to get out of the comfort zone. Like they're already not in the comfort zone because of the culture. So how can we challenge and change the prevailing culture and make things more inclusive, uh, but also impart a sense of belonging? And I know we had a discussion about sense of belonging. Yeah, why don't we, we drive into that right now? Yeah, okay. Um, so a, a lot of the times when they talk about inclusivity and having women, people talk about having a sense of belonging, so feeling belonging. But I come from Iran where the belonging means very different thing to me. So, because in Iran, um, women belong to their male relatives. So you either belong to their, your husband or you belong to your father or uncle or whoever is the closest male relative to you. So sense of belonging for me means that you are, very, you, you, you are somewhere, but you are supposed to be there and oppressed. And so when people say the sense of belonging, I have a different, a diverse point of view. And so we had a little discussion about using that. And so, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think you know that our conversation there just drove to me that uh, it's important to sort of sense when someone is is not quite with you and to delve deeper, and because you learn an awful lot, and that was very fundamental to, to learn. Like, because we use that frame now, you know, diversity, inclusion, belonging, kind of as a uh, as a triad here in our society, mm -hmm. and I I will be very careful in using it now because I hear what well you're inclusion is fine because you have you can measure it you can define it the same with equity or diversity but a sense is hard to define or ha hard to have an impact of it and that's sort of yeah, yeah. but yeah thank you a and one of the things that I have found has been important and, and I'm old enough that. You know, I was one of the few women in the room often throughout my career. And it, um, it was pretty uncomfortable um, many times. As an engineer, not too bad early on because you just draw upon your engineering expertise and you go. But it was as I started to become a leader that, and lead, leadership is all about influence um, and how you influence change and bring people with you. And that's when I really started to notice I felt way more isolated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, somehow I find you have to find your 30%. You know, uh, in any given room, and, and in a lot of influencing away from the table to bring people to uh, to listen to them and also to influence to your perspectives. And because I feel when you when you have 30% of, of a room, um, it, it starts to drive change, and you, and you feel hurt, heard, and you don't feel alone. And I see that in corporate boards that I'm on, you know, at that level. Um, and, and just in general, organic, any kind of meetings, if you have a different perspective, um, you have to sort of build that um, um, coalition to be able to drive change. And so I think that's the, the mindset is, even if you feel like you're alone in a room, what can you do ahead of time or outside of that room to build your 30%? Yeah, thank you. Maybe we can open up the, um, the, uh, the mics or people, if you have any questions. Otherwise, I have, yeah, please. Hi, so thank you for uh, an inspirational talk. I, I, have, I have a selfish question to ask you. I have two daughters in their 20s, and they're just starting to get into the workforce. And I often hear from them about the challenges they face. And they're, I feel sorry for their future romantic partners, because they are go-getters. <laughs> and and uh, they're not going to take any, anything lying down. So the question I have for you, do you have, and you started out with uh, talking about how st stories are really powerful. Do you have a story that you can share either from your perspective that you can share or from somebody that you met that I can share with them when they're experiencing the, uh, the, 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 the uh, challenges of moving in through this corporate world? Yeah. 
Yeah, there's probably many, many stories. Um, I'm just going to give a couple. One, one of my own, and then one of a founder that I just think the world of. Maybe I'll start with her first, and then I'll come to myself. Um, one of the founders that um, the 51 invested in early on is a woman by the name of Bobby Reset, based in Calgary here. Um, it built a company called Virtual Gurus. Um, this is a woman that you know had childhood illnesses, um, is indigenous, is queer, um, and um, still kept driving on. Um, she worked in the oil sands industry and in the downturn uh, around 2016 saw that her job, she was a maintenance worker, was, was going to go away and started to think ahead a bit and said, okay, um, how do I start to find some new work for myself? And what she built in terms of the software um, called Virtual Gurus, she then started to um, bring in others that were rural, this is before COVID, you know, rural, stay at home, uh, not sort of easy to, to find work, um, indigenous and the like, and it's grown from there and she now sells to US corporations, one of our most successful companies, she's amazing. Uh, we uh, nominated her to the International Women's Forum. She got a big fellowship to study in Europe. And, and so you look at this trajectory from, my goodness, like, um, what am I going to do to, to, to earn, earn some money and, and this, uh, this resilience to just say, okay, if I'm having this problem, others are having this pro this, these challenges too. And to, to essentially solve that, and that's what engineers do, that's what entrepreneurs do, and, and ended up creating a business in it. And, and you, you know, when you have a compelling sense of purpose, you bring others around you. So I would say, you know, to your daughters, um, if they're having a tough day, they're probably not the only person that feels the way they do. And uh, to sort of seek out others and, and, and realize that, and t to my point. And, you know, I think if I come down to myself now, um, I was in corporate you know, life from 1985 to 2017. Um, I probably had about seven times in my career at least, probably more, where I thought I was done. Like I'd screwed up so bad that I thought I was done. Um, and some days it was really hard to wake up and you just figure out who's around you that will come with you. Because I had this tendency, I'm being really candid in the room and some of you know me, more of my history, um, to be a little ahead of the curve. And that didn't always go over very well. Um, and I had to learn how to influence. Um, it wasn't the loudest voice. It wasn't necessarily bringing up your key points in, in the meetings, but how do you walk, how do you influence away from the table and build again your 30% in the room? And I, it, it's awesome this morning to see a few people that I've worked with in the past uh, that know a little bit of that journey. Um, and, it, and it's hard. Um, so I think, you know, if I look at the life of entrepreneurs that are successful too, it's not this simple trajectory up. There's all kinds of setups, setbacks. It's, it's the ability to pivot and draw strength in the hardest times and to fearlessly look forward no matter how hard it is that actually drives us. And that's what I would say to them. Yeah, thanks, Judy. Uh-oh, uh, here's a guy that's got too much history of me. <laughs> you know, uh, I was just thinking about uh, Judy's comments about being ahead of the curve. And it, it's absolutely true. I remember well, what I was reflecting on was uh, uh, Judy brought to us, oh, it must have been back, oh, it was very early 2000s. And Judy would bring into the, the leadership group and, uh, uh, you know, we better be paying attention to this ESG stuff. It's, it's going to make a big difference to our industry. And, you know, we were all thinking, oh, shale gas. No, no, come on. It's, it's, they're going to need us. But, you, you know, you were right. And uh, you were, were ahead of the curve there, and you take a look at where we are today, and uh, boy, oh boy, uh, that. But uh, what, so thanks uh, for the words. Uh, my uh, thinking was that, you know, uh, we both went uh, through oil and gas over a, a number of decades, and it's been quite a ride. Uh, you know, you think uh, uh, $100 oil, negative oil prices. Uh, the rise of, uh, you know, as you say, uh, the importance of ESG, uh, regulations, and uh, you know, so it's all uh, quite a ride. And, and I guess I was wondering how you feel this has shaped, is there a unique, uh, how has this shaped leadership? And is there a unique Calgary brand of leadership as a result of uh, these experiences? And, 
and uh, is, uh, as well, not just the leaders, but the entrepreneurs, and just how these uh, shared experiences would uh, shape the Calgary brand. Thanks. Good yeah. job. Thanks. Great question. And with what I continue to be involved in, um, I love living in Calgary, being surrounded here. Uh, I'm involved still nationally. Um, and also globally as well and Board of Petronas. And what, what I've come to realize is we do have a pioneering spirit here. And the tough stuff that's been thrown at us, and I worked early in oil sands in my career and indeed uh, started to really worry about it in around 2006 in terms of what might be happening. And there was a double side to, to profiling our, the big trucks up there and everything there and then the ponds. and. Um, was that by being in the spotlight and how friggin' hard it was, it actually forced um, ourselves to have to be somewhat ahead of the curve. Now, you could say that that's, um, and to figure out how to innovate together, how to really start driving change in, in, in decarbonization. And uh, some of the efforts that, that we all did together then started to set models like, I remember talking to Dan Jurgen, the prize, you know, Sir Wake, and he says, yeah, the work that got going on Canada's Oil Sand Innovation Alliance, COSIA, and with many different entities, that's set a model for many of the global oil and gas companies to far form um, another entity um, that they got because they realized that you could collaborate in areas to drive change. And, and, and so, I, you know, and, and I think if we look at what we've, ha what we've done as well um, on the, in, in partnering in, in the Indigenous frame, yes, it's very, very challenging there. I'm a strong believer in economic re reconciliation and was very involved um, in, in BC and in, in management efforts and collaboratively with Indigenous chiefs and tremendous respect there. And again, this coming together enables you to drive change. And I think so in, in Canada, from an environmental, so if ESG, environmental, everything we've had to learn the hard way and, and work collaboratively to drive change and Pathways is doing that now. Social, particularly on, in, on the Indigenous frame and I can touch a bit more on, on diversity in other frames. And then good governance, Canadians, generally speaking, we, we kind of, I think, have that as, 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 a, as a good strength. We do have many, many elements of strength there and, 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 and I think we've had to, and we've, you know, it's been hard. And I think if we go back to my rural roots, fourth generation farming family, um, how hard it was when people first got onto the land too and, and that resilience. And I think that's just part of our DNA. And you learn from it and you can lead because you've had to overcome difficult things. And so I think within the Canadian scene, there's starting to be a little more respect now for um, what we have done here. And yeah, I've had some hard questions. Oh, well, God, you know, you've got oil and gas in your background. You shouldn't be here when I'm down in Ontario. And then you just talk about everything you've learned and leading on ESG, um, how we are entrepreneurs, how we make things happen. We don't just talk about it and the respect comes. And so I think Canada needs more of Calgary. Canada needs more of Alberta because we just get it done and no matter how hard the barriers just want to follow up on that question. We do have several major challenges, which one of them is significant climate change. And uh, as you mentioned, Calgary is very well suited uh, to deal with this. But at the same time, how can we better prepare, champion, and support leader of tomorrow to make a positive impact? So we're all different ages in this room. Uh, and I think I'm guessing through some of the questions that we're also motivated by having um, a world that, that will be great for the future generations. And I know we see our crazy weather here and we wonder. Uh, not that many years ago, I don't ever remember smoky summers. Um, and, and I think one of the things as well in engineering is um, when we think about how do you encourage all kinds of people to come engineering, that sense of purpose is important. The, the sense that whether it, it's driving toward create solutions so we enable our, uh, a more stable climate, <laughs> you know, and decarbonize the world, uh, and also biodiversity is, is an important part of that too. Um, yeah. And uh, our forests and, and there are critical to our, our mindsets and being able to walk in them and, and decarbonate, you know, and, and, and carbon sinks and the like. And so I think it's just really, really important in terms of how we. Um, support our leaders of tomorrow to show them career paths that actually are meaningful. Um, and, you know, when I, when I work on, uh, with, with, 
certain boards I'm on and the like. Um, gone are the days where you can motivate people financially alone. I don't know if we are ever only motivated financially. We, we, many of us want to ha drive meaningful change. And um, I can't think of anything more meaningful than, than you know, driving um, a sustainable world. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Especially the women. Any question is a good question. <laughs> good, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for the discussion. It's been awesome. Um, you mentioned one of the things um, to look for is these one-in-a-lifetime opportunities. I wonder if there's anything else or if you can speak a little bit about uh, your experience of transitions you know, from different acts and phases in your life and kind of what uh, propels you to make a change and take the next step. Great question. and. I would say when something in you says, mm, that's really, really intriguing, listen to it. Um, when I decided to, to take the, the exchange into the federal government, I was just intrigued around and curious around how do you drive, and proud Canadian, to drive change. I cared a lot about sustainability and that was the driver for going down there. And I think just listen to it. There's all kinds of reasons that I shouldn't have done that, um, including a, a boss at the time that said, I don't want you to go. This is an important role. So CSIS is, you know, Canadian Security Intelligence Agency, or I didn't say that right, but there's all these things that they had to go through to, to give me talk secret security clearance to go down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them that uh, you got, you know, terrorists in your family, he said. So. <laughs> you know, so there's all kinds of, you know, people are saying, we don't think you should do this, but I think it's important to listen to yourself, what's intriguing you, um, and, uh, and it's not going to be the same for every person, so you have to really listen to what's inside. Yeah. And sometimes, as women, we actually don't think we can do it, and I also want to say that if someone believes you can do it and has asked you, it's probably because you can. That's right. So stop self-doubt and just sort of say, why did this people, person ask me? Again, the, the same way to be curious about things, but also be curious about why you are saying no, and then it might help you take that one in a lifetime opportunity when it comes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting, Lali, how did you come to Canada? How, <laughs> it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I didn't want to stay in Iran. There were no opportunities for me to be uh, anybody I wanted to be. But um, at the same time, I got an admission to go to U.S., and they didn't give me visa because they thought I'll go and stay there after I finish my studies, which is, okay, fine. Um, and so I decided at that point that I was going to immigrate to Canada because um, at the time, it was uh, the Quebec separation, uh, separatists, and my, pa my Iranian passport did not, have, did not allow me to travel anywhere. It was not a respected passport, but uh, Jean Chrétien was on the TV a year before I came to Canada showing the Canadian passport and saying, this is the most respected passport in the world. Hmm. And I said, I want to go there. <laughs> so so I, I immigrated to Canada, so that was, uh, that was why. He marketed Canada well then. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> in the middle of a separation <laughs> problem, so. Uh, uh, any other questions? We have time for probably another one more. Yeah, yeah thank awesome. you. And do you mind also introducing yourself? Hi, Lale and Judy. Nice to meet you. My name is Angie Alexander. I'm a leadership consultant, coach, uh, Winset facilitator. Um, I think you've answered some of these questions already, Judy, but I would love for you to talk about um, many of our current leaders are men and um, how can they create that culture that Lale re referred to in terms of bringing the diversity and inclusion um, culture to, uh, to their teams and encourage women and, and any of the other underrepresented people into, into that to really create that space, that psychological space, psychologically safe space. Thanks. Yeah, I'd love to dive into that and then I would love for you to give us a little more color from your perspective too. I, one, one I, suggestion that I would have is around tables, um, deliberately, as any kind of leaders, and 
um, seek out and listen and sort of ask people to contribute, not just um, kind of let the loudest people in the room jump in and, and speak. So, uh, and you know, I'd love to see this, for example, in Creative Destruction Lab when we'll have students uh, that are in talking to the, to, the, to the ventures. A lot of their questions can be better than the gray haired those amongst us in terms of our questions. So whether it's from, you know, d different experience, age, women, um, other, you know, people from other cultures, um, as a leader, deliberately ask for those perspectives. Don't let them stay silent. Um, and then sometimes you have to facilitate a bit. Somebody else is jumping in. Because, yes, I mean, this classic point around make a point, and then many times later somebody else will make the same point, and, and it just all bounces off that. Just it really, I think, as a leader, you need to be the facilitator. You need to be the chair at the table. That's not just about your voice, but really pulling out the voices of, of all at the table. So I, I love that, uh, that uh, um, uh, idea. So, yeah, but I, I would also, I, I look at it a little bit differently. I'm one of those per people who always looks for the root causes. Yep. And I think our systems are built so that we don't succeed as much possible. And one of my friends yesterday was telling me, like, you know, an average basketball player is a foot taller than the average man. So for me, who's very short, doesn't really matter how much I try. I can never become a really good basketball player. And so what we need to also do is look at those systems that are in place that doesn't allow that inclusion. Um, that doesn't reward the, the leaders who have tried to uh, bring in all the perspectives. And what we reward is maybe making decisions really quickly or looking very determined or having a heavy hand. Or those, those will not help us with making that system. And then rewarding those people who are leading with an uh, inclusive point of view and uh, so on. Could I just add one more idea to this? Uh, and it, part of it comes from the, the momentum and drive that, that we have for the, the 51, is what I've noticed in the room too is, particularly I think when you're amongst other engineers, business people, numbers do matter. Because if you can quote a couple facts and the like, it will substantiate your points with more um, oomph. And, and getting comfortable in that realm. And, and, and I think what I hate seeing is incredibly bright um, women um, that, that either are not enabled to go into that space or themselves self-select out and say, I, I can't figure that out. And um, I'm gonna get, give a bit of a bugbear here right now, which is the number of times I've, that I've heard Oh, no, 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 like, uh, you know, she'll never figure out how to be a CEO because she can't figure out capital markets, like how money is raised and all the rest of that. It can be figured out. It's just a matter of being invited to be there and to, to choose to do there and do your work away from the table to, to learn um, and, and network and get advice and the like. Uh, there, there is, so I think we, we can't just presume, that, and what I'm getting at is the networks also have to in, invite um, women in, like in the world of finance. And the world of finance is even harder than engineering. One of the things, and, and, and um, Dean um, Jim DeWalt's been an amazing partner with us, and he said part of the reason was because he was seeing women that were in their BCOMs and they'd get out, and there was only, in rooms, 10% women were fi in finance. Engineering's a lot better than that. I mean, closer to 20, right? And so, so I think we have to really, really encourage as well and recognize what's stopping you from being fully influential as women. So a lot of times it's also the comfort and, and driving on numbers and the financial side. So I just as we're closing to the end of the session, unfortunately, I was wondering if you have any calls to action. Yeah, and one of the things that I've learned a lot being in the entrepreneurial space lately is progress over perfection. And uh, I use that as a slogan to myself, a man, uh, you know, mantra every, every, every day. And leaving uh, the room today uh, and a call to action, um, would love to leave with you. And, and I'm going to put this time bound because I think when you set milestones, things happen. And so today is the 25th of May. Yeah. Before the end of June, I challenge everyone in the room to seek out someone that's in a different world than yours. 
ideally a woman, and uh, get to know them a bit more, um, and particularly if they have similar interests in you, um, and, and learn from them, brainstorm a bit, and then who knows what you can co-create to make happen. Uh, but that, that, that being intentional about seeking out others from outside your world, but that, make, that might be interested in the same things as you, um, that's where change comes, emanates from. That's where we're innovative. That's Calgary. That's Alberta's pioneering spirit that we work together as a community to drive change. So I would leave that with you. Yeah, thank you. And now we have all our homework. And this is, I guess, the perfect spot to end the conversation and get into the final formalities of the event. Thank you so much, Judy, for coming. It was great uh, discussions. And now I would like to send it back to Bill for some closing remarks. Progress like over perfection. <laughs> I'm going to be thinking about that for the next six weeks, so thank you. <laughs> in, thank you, Lolly and Judy, for such a wonderful, um, wonderful discussion this morning. Um, tr truly was brilliant, so thank you so much. And thank you, everyone here, for your attendance. Um, really appreciate that you spent part of your morning with us. Hope you've enjoyed yourself. As I said, this is the last Schulich Connects for our academic year. And so I will hope to see many of you back in the fall when we restart again. Until then, have a great day and enjoy your summer. Thank you. It's like having a spotlight on this, eh? <laughs>